coming to the place of healing day after day, week after week, and year after year. Perhaps Jesus knew that sometimes, in spite of our actions and our words, we have secretly given up on ourselves. We have given up on our situations and really don't believe we can be or are going to be healed, helped, heard, or made whole. Sometimes we can habitually go through certain actions, or routinely participate in certain rituals or procedures, and customarily say certain things without really believing in what we're doing or in what we're saying. Or sometimes like Samson rising from the lion's lap after she had cut his hair while he slept, we may have lost our faith. We may have lost our strength without knowing it. Thus, this question, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be healed? This question helps us to confront ourselves and ask ourselves truthfully and honestly, do we still have the desire, first, for healing, and second, do we still have the faith that makes that desire a possibility? Have we built a tent around our problem that is an impermanent structure and implies that one day we're going to pack up and move on? Or have we built a house around our affliction that is a permanent structure and says that this spot is the place of our habitation. Someone has said that we could endure the terrors of hell if we believed that we would one day get out and that the suffering would only last for a season. Some of us feel that we're living in hells because we've been like we are and where we are for so long that short of death, we've given up hope of ever getting out. There are various reasons for the inherent contradiction between going to the pool on the one hand and having secretly given up hope for healing on the other. Sometimes, beloved, our faith is worn down by the sheer length of time We've had the problem. 38 years is a long time to put up with anything. I told the 8 o'clock crowd this morning, some of y'all been married that long and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> some of us have lived with our affliction for so long that we don't know how to be any other way but miserable. Uh, we've complained about our problems, we've complained about our ailments, our families, our jobs, and our churches for so long that all we know how to do is complain. Uh, we beg for so long that begging is all we know. Uh, we've been crying poor for so long that even when we've been abundantly blessed, we're still crying poor and acting poor and living poor. We're more inclined to frown than to smile. We find it easier to criticize than to congratulate and tend to look for what's wrong rather than for what's right. Even when some of us make an effort at being positive, we still end up sounding negative. You know, a person once looked in the mirror and said, I'm tired of all these negative feelings that I've been having about myself and about others and about life. And I'm going to think some positive thoughts. I'm going to start believing in myself. I'm going to think all these positive things, 
even though they probably won't help me much or do me much good. Sometimes, beloved, our faith is worn down because of the number of times that our hopes have been raised and then frustrated. Who knows how many times the man had been brought to the pool with raised hope that he would be healed on that day. Who knows how many times he had been close, but not close enough to be the first to step into the water when it was trouble. Oh, it's hard to keep one's faith up when we've been disappointed and frustrated time after time. <clears throat> Thus, to keep our faith from being shattered altogether, what do we do? We start lowering our expectations. Hear us as we say, I'll give this church, for instance, a chance, but I won't be surprised if this experience turns out negatively just like the others. I, I'll give this person a chance, but, but I just know that sooner or later, she's going to mess up. Some of us have been knowing people and watching people and living with people for years and are still afraid to trust them. I'll try this new doctor or hire a new lawyer, but this person probably won't be able to do any more than the others. Or my companion, my friend, and I had a good talk and reached a good understanding, but we've done that before, so I really don't expect things to change very much. Well, beloved, when we expect little from other people and from ourselves, that's usually what we get, and that's all we're going to see even when much is happening. I'm going to try sending her to a new school. I'm going to try sending, put him into another class, or she's going to move to another department, but I'll be surprised if the results are any better. I'm going to continue praying even though nothing is happening. But first of all, we don't know all that may be happening. We don't know what things God is setting in place. We don't know whose heart God is touching. We don't know how, when, or where God is working. But know this, beloved. God is working all the time. God never sleeps. God's watchful eye never shuts. God's grace, power, and love never go on vacation. Second of all, let us remember that we are not simply instructed to pray without ceasing, but to pray believing. I know it's hard to be positive in the face of repeated failures and disappointments, but hold on to your hope. And don't give up. If we're children of God, we should never lower our expectations because with God, all things are possible. We must continue expecting God to do great things and to produce mighty works in our lives. What we desire may or may not happen, but the possibility is there if we don't give up. However, I submit that when we lose hope, we shut the door in possibilities face. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? There are some things in life, beloved, we just have to want for ourselves. Teachers may want their students to learn, but those students must want to learn for themselves. How have so many black folk come from places, from schools that uh, were separate and unequal and underfunded and become honor students and scholars and then competed with uh, the majority of folks at major colleges and universities and later in the marketplace? Because they wanted to learn. Before we criticize the schools too severely for all they're not doing with our children, we must
must, I believe, realize that our children need to make up their minds that they want to learn. Yes, sir. We must decide we're going to be something or somebody on our own. Mother or father, sister or brother, friend or companion, pastor or teacher can't make that decision for us. If we don't want to be anything, then no matter what opportunities present themselves to us, they will be like pearls before swine. Now they will be wasted on us and will become nothing. And if we want to be something and do something worthwhile, then no matter what obstacles are set before us, we'll find a way to deal with them. Or God will help us, or the Holy Spirit will direct us in how to handle them, and we'll become something and accomplish something anyhow. Yes. Benjamin Elijah Mays, President Emeritus of Morehouse College, perhaps said it best when he posited, it must be borne in mind that the tragedy of life doesn't lie in not reaching your goal. The tragedy lies in having no goal to reach. It isn't a calamity to die with dreams unfulfilled, but it is a calamity not to dream. It is not a disaster to be unable to capture your ideal, but it is a disaster to have no ideal to capture. It is not a disgrace not to reach the stars, but it is a disgrace <clears throat> to have no stars to reach for. Not failure, but low aim is sin. <clears throat> we run from doctor to doctor, hospital to hospital, use prescription after prescription, and pray for miracles in vain if we haven't really decided that we want to be here. Good to have other folks pray for us, but we have to decide ourselves that we want to live. Now, before we can turn our backs upon temptation and change our lifestyles, we must decide that we are serious about living for God. We should pray for folks who are outside the church are loved ones, but at some point they must decide for themselves that they want to be here. Before we can live clean and sober and free from drugs and alcohol and other, other vices, we have to decide that that is what we want to do. Do you want to be healed? Our crucial question challenges us to decide what kind of life we want to have. The lame man answered Jesus, and answered his question by saying, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm making my way, another, another person steps down ahead of me. Now this is a very touching story <clears throat> and an interesting explanation as to why the man hadn't been healed. The only problem with his statement was that it didn't answer Jesus' question. The master did not ask the lame man about who did what to him or who stepped into the water before him. He did not ask the lame man about his background or his past disappointments or frustrations and failed attempts. And as knows as some of us are, we might take the time to ask those questions. <laughs> but not Jesus. He asked a simple question that required a simple yes or no answer, and that question was, do you want to be healed? Oh, beloved, this day, right now, Jesus is knocking on the door of somebody's heart, and he is asking one simple question. We don't need to give the Lord a lot of answers to unasked questions. He's not asking us to give him some long, drawn-out story about who did what to us and who talked about us or who doesn't like us or who won't work with us. He's not asking us about how we get into, got into our condition or, or how we allowed ourselves to get into such a position. He isn't asking us how long we've been like we are and how many times in the past we've tried to get it right and failed. He's not even asking us how many opportunities for healing we've let go by and why. And he's certainly not asking us about anyone else's business and faults and failures. Because Jesus sees our condition and knows what we need and has what we need. And he's just asking us to give a simple yes or no answer to the question.
wonderful story it goes on to say that Jesus told the man to stand up, take your mat, take your pallet and walk. Stand up, take your mat and walk. Beloved, I've discovered that if we want to be healed, we're going to have to do something. The Lord didn't pull the man up or prop the man up or pick the man up. He only told him to stand up. He didn't even touch the man. He just spoke a word of healing to him. And the man had to have enough faith and submissiveness to obey Jesus' word. He had to want healing bad enough. He had to be desperate enough to obey Jesus' word even when he was commanded to do what seemed to be impossible for him to do. I guess the question comes for us, do we want healing badly enough? Are we desperate enough to obey Jesus' word even when Jesus commands us to do difficult things, some of which seem to be impossibilities for us? Jesus told the man to take up the mat that he had been lying upon. And what struck me is that those who have been healed ought not be empty handed. Well, what do you mean? Well, what are we carrying? Now, some people carry bitterness from the past. Some people carry excuses for not doing more than they're doing. Now, some people carry stones for throwing at their neighbors. But Jesus told us what to carry, he told us in the Gospel of Matthew, if any man or woman would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Here's what I mean. Take the mats that once held us from which we could not rise and carry them in our hearts as a testimony to what the Lord has done for us. The sickness, the failures, the weaknesses and mistakes of the past from which we could not rise then become the testimonies that we carry in our hearts about how the Lord can raise us. And we can tell others, if you don't believe that God's power is real, let me show you my map. Or let me sing my song of praise. Let me tell my story of victory. Let me give my witness about how Jesus is able. And then lastly, Jesus, after he told him to stand and take his mat, he said, walk. Walk. <coughs> Jesus told the man to walk. Oh, beloved, he's speaking through eternity and saying to us, walk by faith. Even though it seems like you're going through a veil of darkness right now, stand up and walk by faith with your head up, praising and glorifying God. Some people may not understand why you walk like you do, but you know what the Lord has done and is doing for you. Some people may not believe your witness, but keep on walking. Because you know that you've been raised. Keep on walking. And walk by the grace of God. Walk in Jesus' name. Walk by the power of the Spirit. Walk. And Jesus has promised us, each and every one here today, that we'll never walk.